Our scripture reading for today is from John 9. Please follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. Hear the word of the Lord first from John 9, 1 through 12. As he went along, he saw a, blind, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This, this word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Josh. Would you pray with me? God, we pray this morning, open our eyes to see. Open our eyes, Lord, to the condition of our hearts. Open our eyes to see your truth. Open our eyes to see your grace. And Lord, open our eyes that we may truly see Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Today, we are on the sixth miraculous sign of Jesus from the Gospel of John, and hopefully you have noticed by now that each sign has its own image on your bulletin covers, and we've had a new image each week of the series that represents uh, this, the miraculous sign that we are talking about that Sunday. And so if you look on your bulletin covers, you'll see uh, a symbol or an image for each of the, of the six signs so far. Uh, and so far we have covered water into wine, the official's son, the paralyzed man, the feeding of the 5,000. Last week Sunday we had the miracle of walking on water, and today we are talking about the man who was born blind. Next week Sunday, as promised, on Easter Sunday we'll be talking about uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And so two invitations real quickly. Uh, because Palm Sunday is today, today is the start of Holy Week, and that means that Friday is Good Friday. And so we will have a Good Friday service here at Calvary at 7 p.m. This will be what is called a Tenebrae service, uh, and we will also celebrate the Sacrament of Communion together. Then on Easter Sunday, one week from today, we do not have Sunday school, but we do have an Easter brunch starting at 9.30. And this brunch is a great way to get some breakfast, uh, to tide you over until your big Easter celebrations. Uh, and it's also it's an opportunity to, to spend some time together, uh, together with your church family as we celebrate new life and resurrection as a covenant community. And of course, our worship Easter celebration will follow that meal. Today, of course, we're going to talk about the man who is born blind from John 9, which is a miracle that I have already preached on here at Calvary in another sermon series, which I'm sure you all remember. And so today will somewhat be review 
Uh, But of course, we're approaching this miracle from another angle, placing it in the context of the seven miraculous signs of Jesus. And the first thing I want to acknowledge about this sixth miraculous sign is that this takes place during something called the Feast of Tabernacles. If we go way back to John 7 verse 2, John tells us that we are in the Feast of Tabernacles and that Jesus is there. And here we are in John chapter 9. It is still the Feast of Tabernacles. And so everything that is happening is about the same time frame and the same region. We don't know much about the Feast of Tabernacles. But one of the really cool things that happened and that everybody looked forward to about the Feast of Tabernacles were these nightly light ceremonies. Each night of the feast, there would be several very large basins that were filled with large logs. One commentator saying that there were 120 logs in each basin, in addition to a number of candelabras uh, across the city. And all these lights during the Feast of Tabernacles would illuminate the city of Jerusalem. This might not sound like a very big deal to us, but this, of course, is before electricity, when all you have is candles to light at night. And so this was an incredibly unique thing, to have the whole city illuminated in the darkness. And it is during the Feast of Tabernacles, in the midst of all these nightly light celebrations, that Jesus declares in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Which, of course, as we know from last week, is Jesus again asserting himself as the I am, asserting himself as God, and he's also asserting himself here as the means by which we see. Our passage, then, we need to understand in the context of all of this. Not only is Jesus proclaiming that he is the light of the world, he is, in our passage, he's proving it. He's showing it. He's causing this man who's been in darkness his whole life to see. He is the light of the world, and then he proves it. In the sixth miraculous sign, Jesus comes across a man who has known nothing but darkness. A man who has been blind his whole life. And before Jesus heals this man who's known nothing but darkness, in John 9 verse 5 in our passage, he says again, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We need to make the connection between Jesus being the light of the world and this miracle where Jesus makes this blind man to see. And the blind man, we are, told, is told to, or we are told, is told to go and wash, and he is given sight. Now, I've got to make a comment about a few different things going on here, because there are several rabbit trail discussions related to this story, and we could spend a lot of time going down each one of them. First of all, we've got the discussion about whether or not sin has something to do with this man's blindness. That's one rabbit trail discussion. Another one, for reasons that are mystifying to us, Jesus spits in the ground, he makes a mud pie, and then he puts it on this man's eyes, which sounds really gross to us. Why does he do this? There is an entire huge rabbit trail discussion with scholars and commentators and preachers and pastors that all have something to say about why Jesus does this. And then we've got the washing, which sounds like some kind of baptism. That's another rabbit trail discussion. We've got confusion from the community about whether or not this is actually the man who is born blind. Got all sorts of different things happening here. And there's all these good and interesting discussions to be had, particularly about this man's blindness being because of his sin or his parents' sin, because this raises the whole question of human suffering. 
And I did want to take just a moment to say and to point out that Jesus very clearly says no in this discussion. Jesus makes it clear that things like blindness and other ways of suffering are not because of our personal sin or our parents' sin, and this is consistent throughout Scripture. Now again, unfortunately, we do not have time to go too deeply with this part of the story, and we are not going to, mainly because I do not believe that this is the main point of the miraculous sign. Okay, so we're going to move on into what this sign is saying to us. And so we must also acknowledge this morning, as we did last week, the connection between the miraculous sign and the creation story. We made this connection last week. We got to make it again today. Genesis 1-3, God says, let there be light. And there was light. The creation story is one where God not only brings order from the chaos, which is what he did last week, he brings light from the darkness, which is what Jesus is proclaiming and doing in our passage today. Let there be light is the first thing that God speaks in the Bible. God is a God of light. He speaks, and the whole universe is illuminated. Fast forward to the New Testament, and we have Jesus declaring and showing that he is the light of the world. He is the one who brings light into the darkness. And in this miraculous sign, Jesus literally opens a man's eyes from a lifetime of darkness. As with all the signs, Jesus is once again asserting himself as God. And this is certainly part of the miracle and the message for us today, that Jesus and only Jesus can truly make us see that he is not only the light of the whole world, but that he can open our eyes. He can bring light to our darkness. We are all blind and in darkness, and only Jesus can make us truly see. Only Jesus can truly bring light to each of our darkness. However, even though that is certainly part of the sign here today in John chapter 9, I want to submit to you this morning that we won't understand the full point of the miraculous sign unless we keep reading in the story. And if we kept reading in John chapter 9, we would learn that a group of people called the Pharisees They start to get involved. They investigate the healing and they interview the man and they question whether or not Jesus can be from God at all. And later on in John chapter 9, Jesus again meets this blind man in John 9.35, which we did not read, and Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind man who can now see says, who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. His eyes are truly open. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And then he worshiped. Him. This is an important part of the story as well. You only worship God. And this man who is made to see, he worships Jesus. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Verse 40, Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What, are we blind too? Jesus said, If only you were blind, you would have no more sin. But now that you keep saying, we see, your guilt remains. 
The sixth miraculous sign isn't only about Jesus having the power to make us see and bring light to the darkness. If we're going to understand the full point of this miracle, one of the things that we have to understand is who the Pharisees are. And so real quickly, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are Jewish religious leaders whose goal it was to protect and preserve Judaism through obedience. And so the Pharisees, what they did was they constructed a lifestyle of rules and obligations and regulations, ways to follow laws. They set up all kinds of boundaries to help the Jewish people obey God. And more importantly, what we need to understand is that the Pharisees, they started with the right intentions. They wanted to obey God and to follow God's commandments and to ensure the people of Israel would be in right relationship with their Creator. And I think we can all agree this is a good intention, this is a righteous intention. However, In their efforts to see God, to obey God, they ended up being blind to God. The Pharisees were trying so hard to obey God, they ended up missing God. Their sight became so fixated on what they thought was right and true, they were blinded to who Jesus is. The miracle of the blind man is not just about sight, it's also about our spiritual blindness and the ways that we are blind to who Jesus is. There is an, this is an irony of this story that you and I are not supposed to miss. And the irony is that the blind man is the one who sees Jesus. And the men who are so convinced that they are the ones that can see, they are the ones who are blind. The story of the sixth miraculous sign is not only about the reality that Jesus as God makes this blind man to see and brings light to his darkness. It's also about the irony that those who think they can see are actually the ones who are blind. The blind man, because he recognizes that Jesus must be from God, he is the one who truly sees. And the Pharisees, the ones who think they can see, the religious leaders, they think that they are the ones with the answers, they are the ones with the real truth, they are the ones who know better, they are the ones who are obeying, keeping the law. And they can't see who Jesus is. And Jesus comes along and says to this group of religious leaders who are so convinced that they can see, he declares to them, you are blind. It is a powerful, painful irony. And the sixth miraculous sign meets us today and asks us, which one are we? Are we the blind man who sees who Jesus is and believes? Or are we like the religious leaders who think they can see, who think they have the truth, but are actually blind and missing out on what God is doing? Years ago, I was reading a book by Eugene Peterson, and he used an illustration about this miracle and the Pharisees that And it was an illustration that had a profound effect on me, and it made me see things for the first time. And it's an illustration that I've used before in a sermon here at Calvary, and it's such a powerful illustration that I would like to use it again. In the illustration, Peterson invites us to imagine yourself moving into a house with a huge picture window overlooking a grand view across a wide expanse of water enclosed by a range of snow-capped mountains. Several times a day, you interrupt your work 
and stand before this window to take in the majesty and the beauty. One afternoon, you notice some bird droppings on the window glass, and so you get out a bucket of water and a towel and you clean the window. Another day, visitors come with a small tribe of dirty-fingered children. The moment they leave, you see all the smudge marks on the glass. They are hardly out the door before you have the bucket out. Keeping that window clean develops into an obsessive compulsive neurosis. You accumulate ladders and buckets and squeegees. You construct scaffolding on the inside and the outside to make it possible to clean all the difficult corners and heights. You have the cleanest window in North America. But now it's been years since you've looked through it. You, says Peterson, have become a Pharisee, blinded to the beauty and majesty of God. The Pharisees, once again, are people who started with the right intention of enjoying the beautiful view that is God, seeing God, basking in the light of God. But they got so preoccupied with obedience and keeping their lives clean that they became blind to God in Jesus Christ and their need to have God make them clean. The question that this miracle asks us is this, do we do this? Are we blinded by our own self-righteousness? Are we blinded by our own view of the truth? Are we blinded by our politics? Are we so fixated on what we think is right, on the ways that we believe we can see, that we are blind to God in Jesus Christ? Many of us here today, we've been born and raised in the church. Many of us pride ourselves on being moral people who behave in the right way and make good life choices. We like the comfort and the familiarity of church and the way that we do church. And many of us, compared to the rest of the world, we're really good people. But the sixth miraculous sign challenges us. Do we think we can see on our own? Do we like to think that we are the ones that have everything figured out, that we have the answers, that we are the ones with sight, and we are so focused on how we think things ought to be done that we miss the beauty who is God and the things that He is doing? And so I ask us today, in what ways are we as individuals, in what ways are we spiritually blind? In what ways are we as a church, Calvary Church? In what ways are we as a community blind? In what ways are we as a denomination, the Christian Reformed Church of North America? In what ways are we as a group of people blind? In what ways are we as the church in North America blind? Do we love our church tradition and our religious routines more than we love God? Do we love our programs and the way we've always done it more than what God wants to do through us? Do we care more about maintaining the church than being the church? Do we care more about politics and the kingdom of this world than we care about King Jesus and his kingdom? Are we so preoccupied with being right that we miss the beauty of God and what He's doing? Having Scripture, having church, having the truth, getting to worship each week, we have this incredible view of God. We get to see Him at work. We get to experience His grace, His mercy, His love. We've got a front row seat to the light of the world and all that He is doing in the darkness. 
Do we enjoy the view? Do we behold the glory of God and the light of God in Jesus Christ? Jesus meets us today in our spiritual blindness, whether we think we can see or not. He meets us in our spiritual blindness, in our sin, our darkness, and he proclaims to each one of us here today, only I can make you see. The fact that this man was born blind reminds all of us here today that we are all born in sin. We are all born into blindness. We all spend our lives in darkness until Jesus makes us see. The fourth miraculous sign from a few weeks ago, the feeding of the 5,000, that miracle proclaimed to us, only Jesus can truly satisfy us. The fifth sign, last week, walking on water, that miracle proclaimed to us, only Jesus can truly comfort us. The sixth sign, the healing of the blind man proclaims to us, only Jesus can make us see. He is the one who opens our eyes to sin. He is the one that opens our eyes to grace and forgiveness. He is the one that opens our eyes to truth. He is the one that opens our eyes to see Him for who He is, the Son of God sent to redeem the world. The sixth sign invites us to say, with the blind man, verse 25, one thing I do know, I once was blind, but now I see. Amen, and thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you and we praise you that you are a God who brings light to the darkness of this world. A God who gives us the light of the world in Jesus Christ. And a God who opens our eyes to see him. God, may we see and may we cherish Jesus as the light of the world. May we see and may we cherish Jesus as the Son of God. May we see and cherish Jesus as the one who gives us sight. And may we find rest, peace, and comfort, and sight in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.